Well, good Sunday morning. We're glad you could join us for this uh, virtual worship this morning. And uh, hopefully, before long, we'll be back together. But until now, uh, it's good that we could join together, and I'm glad that you could join with us this morning. I'd love to make some announcements about things coming up, but right now nothing's coming up. We still remain in isolation, but the word is that uh, this uh, coming month we'll be getting out and our governor is releasing some of the, uh, our isolation guidelines and uh, hopefully we'll get together soon here in a few weeks. Uh, this morning, let's uh, begin our time together just with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in an isolated way, but somehow feel like we are gathered together here in worship. Father, we just ask this morning that as we, as we worship, that you'll lift our spirits and uh, draw us into your word. And Father, we pray that you'll speak to us today. We pray through Christ. Amen.
I'd like to ask you to join with us in your copy of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 27. We'll be reading from our text from that passage there this morning here in just a few moments. In chapter 27, we find the Jewish leaders having condemned Jesus to death, turning him over to the Gentiles, and that is to Pilate, the Roman governor. And these movements are according to Scripture in the Old Testament and also the prophecy that Jesus gave in chapter 20 of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 20 verse 18 tells us we are going up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be raised to life. And before recording his defense before Pilate, uh, Matthew gives us the, uh, an account of the fate of Judas. He's the only one of the gospel writers that gives us this information. And because it's there, it's worth our time of uh, taking a look at it this morning. Judas serves as a great warning that you can spend considerable time with Jesus and not be saved. You can be a witness of the miracles. You can participate in the church. You can hear a lot of sermons. We've noticed in our home that uh, while we've been locked down, we're having more experience of worship than when we were uh, free to move about. Uh, generally on Sunday mornings, we would come to church and have our message and enjoy our time of worship. But uh, these days we tune in early to our son's pastor and watch his message. And then we flip over and watch a friend's sermon. And uh, then we listen to the message here at Markham Street. And so we're getting our sample of, uh, uh, quite the sample of uh, Easter messages. But you can hear sermon after sermon via video and still be lost. Peter was aware of this possibility. In uh, 2 Peter uh, verse one, verse chapter, or ch chapter 1, verse 10, we read these words. Peter wrote, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you'll, be re receive, you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal, eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're never told exactly why Judas betrayed Jesus. I believe that part of the reason was that uh, he was frustrated. Uh, we know that he skimmed the top of the treasury of the disciples, and I believe he looked for preeminence and power when Jesus established his kingdom, and it seemed now that his dreams would not be fulfilled. I wonder if he expected Jesus to miraculously deliver himself. He had seen this happen before. Things did not work out this way this time. And staying in the shadow of Caiaphas's courtroom, Judas watched the trial of Jesus. And when we come to chapter 27, we read these words. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. And when things didn't work out as well as Judas thought, I believe he was filled with remorse. When he saw Jesus being transferred to Pilate, he realized it's not going to work out this time. The full enormity of his treachery began to weigh heavy on his conscience. And his act to us defies comprehension. He was one of the twelve. But he became a willing instrument of Satan. Luke 22 verse 3 reveals to us these somber words that Satan entered into Judas. 
We'll consider this passage with two broad strokes this morning. One, I want us just to notice the traitor's misery. Look in verse 3. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. We need to understand this morning that remorse is not repentance. Remorse is feeling guilty or sad about a decision. Usually it's expressed when we've been caught, when we didn't want to be caught. But it's not that we're sad that we uh, wanted to change our way. We just realize the guilt that we bear in the decision that we've made. Judas changed his mind about betraying Jesus, but he did not express biblical repentance. I say Jesus, Judas made a 90 degree turn. Think about this. Repentance is 180 degrees. You're walking one direction and all of a sudden you're suddenly walking in the opposite direction. That's re repentance. That's biblical repentance. I say Judas made a 90 degree turn. He, he, he acknowledged his sin. That was a 90 degree turn, but he never turned his faith to Jesus Christ for salvation. So Judas did not make a, 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 an act of biblical repentance. He did feel remorse. Verse 5 tells us that Judas threw the money into the temple and left. In a final act of desperation, Judas flung the silver coins across the wall into that sanctuary where the chief priests were walking with Jesus as they headed from Caiaphas' court toward the palace of Pilate. And Judas' remorse is held in contrast with Peter's repentance in the context. Remember that uh, chapter 27 should not separate us from thinking back into the latter part of chapter 26 where we read about Peter's failure. Peter failed, but he did not fall. Judas fell headlong uh, right into the depth of eternity. The difference is seen between them in their outcome. Peter went out and wept bitterly over his actions, and Judas committed suicide over his. That's what the Bible tells us here in the latter part of verse 5. Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, here's a question. Where is Judas today? Is he in heaven or is he in hell? The Bible is very clear on that point. Judas is in hell. In Acts 1.25, Peter spoke of Judas as he left his apostolic ministry to go where he belongs, the Bible says. Literally, those verses mean to go to his own place. His own place is hell. If that seems harsh to us, we need to consider the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 70, when he said, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. He did not literally mean that Judas was a demon, but that Judas was, uh, e e even though he was a man, had been filled even a, a, a year before the crucifixion with Satan under his influence. Uh, listen to Jesus as he prays in the upper room on Thursday night. Judas has left to make the final arrangements and even now the soldiers are gathering for the march on the Mount of Olives and the final act is about to play itself out. Meanwhile, Jesus is praying for his disciples when he said, While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Well, dear friends, Judas is in hell today. He's been there for 2,000 years, and he'll be there forever. 
He has paid the ultimate price for the crime of betraying the Son of God. If someone asks, did Judas lose his salvation? The answer is no, he didn't lose his salvation because he never had it. Whatever else you can say about him, he was never a true follower of Jesus Christ in the same sense as the other apostles. He was not saved and then lost. He was lost because he never had been saved in the first place. But if someone else may say, did Judas go to hell because he committed suicide? Well, that's a good question. And the answer once again is no. Judas, Judas did not go to hell because he committed suicide. I used to hear that. I've I heard that from time to time, that suicide's an act that you can't be forgiven for. Well, suicide is not an act that you can't be forgiven for. Suicide is a sin, but that's not why Judas went to hell. Judas went to hell because he never truly committed himself to Jesus Christ. His betrayal proved that fact. His suicide merely sealed his fate. Well, we've observed the traitor's misery. What about the money? What about the traitor's money? We'll take one other broad stroke this morning. In verse 6, we read these words. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. It's interesting to note that they're going to murder their own Messiah, but they're concerned to keep the law concerning this money. They took it out of the temple treasury to pay Judas, but they would not put it back in the treasury because it was blood money. Blood money, by definition, is money illegitimately paid to falsely convict a person when it led to his execution. By calling the 30 pieces of silver blood money, they testified of their guilt and hypocrisy. Just they weren't aware of it. In verse 7 we read, they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That's why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that was spoke, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set him, uh, for him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. I mean, 30 years later, when Matthew was writing, it was still referred to as a field of blood because it was common knowledge that it was bought with the blood money that crucified Jesus Christ. Well, at the outset of our message, I referred to 2 Peter chapter 1. Remember chapter 1 verse 10 of 2 Peter. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think Peter was shocked that Judas, one of the Lord's trusted apostles, would betray him. I also think Peter was strongly affected by his suicide. This morning, I want directly to ask you if you're certain that you've been born again. That was Peter's concern, that you make certain. Make your election sure. Be positive. Don't wonder. Don't guess. Be sure that you've been born again. Uh, if you've confessed your sin to Jesus and asked Him to forgive you and you meant it from your heart, you can be confident in your faith. Listen to me. If you've never been born again, there will come a time that you'll wish you'd never been born. I want to speak clearly to the person who's joined us this morning and you've considered suicide as a viable option. It's interesting that we come to Judas's story when we're all locked down and facing some sense of isolation and desperation. We've heard that uh, during our coronavirus lockdown that there will be 
an, uh, an increase in suicides. This Tuesday, I heard of my first one. This uh, Thursday, I heard of my second one. And uh, we expect there will be more uh, just because people can't stand the isolation and the sense of separation, the loss of income, whatever the cause that's brought it about. I want to talk to you this morning if you've ever felt about being uh, committing suicide as a viable option. It never is. I have a friend. His name is Ron Tolles. Ron is a Baptist pastor today. But before he was a pastor, Ron was a businessman and was going through some difficult days. And he decided he was going to commit suicide. Uh, he arranged the place and knew exactly how he was going to do it. There was a road not far from his home with a uh, the road had a sharp curve in it with a very large tree in that curve and Ron was going to get his car going at a very fast uh, speed and just drive headlong into that tree and just end it all. That way his wife could receive insurance money and would do fine and Ron had it all scoped out and the day that he was going to go commit suicide he kissed his wife, told her he would be back, left in that car. But as Ron got on that road, on that straight stretch before that tree, he said that he just sped that car up. And as he sped that car faster and faster, it all of a sudden dawned on him that if there was a God, he was about to meet him. And Ron pulled his car over on the side of the road, confessed his sin, and was born again. And Ron today is a Baptist preacher. Someone says, well, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand how I feel. Well. Dear friend, I, I don't have to understand how you feel to let you know that many people have felt that way. And if you're feeling a sense of isolation and desperation today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that there is a better hope through Jesus Christ. Uh, I mentioned that I've heard a couple of suicides that have already started taking place, and I'm sure that there are others that I've not heard about. I, want to, I just want to encourage you this morning that death does not relieve guilt. It only makes it permanent and intensifies it beyond comprehension. I want to invite you this morning to turn to Christ and to pray this prayer. If you've never trusted in Him before, I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I acknowledge that you are God's Son and that you died for my sin. And though I've never really confessed it before, today I do and ask you to come into my life and cleanse me of my sin. And Father, I want to follow you now all the days of my life through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. And dear friend, I want to encourage you this morning that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're feeling a sense of isolation and desperation, and maybe you've even considered suicide. I want to tell you, there's, don't do that. There's no way for you to do that and be justified. It's a sin. It's a sin that takes away your life from the purpose that God intends, intends you for. And I want you to hang in there, and I want you to give me a call. If you need some help, there's a help there are helps available. I want you to, uh, I'm gonna, I, I've asked you during our broadcast to drop me an email at my personal email address. I'm going to do that again this morning. It is James and Ava, James, A-N-D-A-V-A, -A, at hotmail.com. If you have prayed to receive Christ this morning, or if you need some help getting through this difficult time, I want to ask you to drop me a line and uh, let me know so that we can offer you some help. And if you prayed to receive Christ, we want to give you some material for you to walk through to help you just kind of begin your relationship with Him. And uh, we want to say once again, it's glad that you could, I'm glad that you could join us for worship this morning. And uh, until we meet again at 9701 West Markham, I want to say uh, we just are glad that we could virtually worship this morning. And till, till next week, uh, have be safe, be healthy, and we'll see you this time next next week. Amen.